Hi, I'm Wanda Urbanska. Do you remember how maybe in high school, maybe in college, you read a certain book, you had a certain teacher, and you got really inspired? You caught a vision of how the world could be, and you wanted to be a part of changing that world for the better. I want you to meet someone, a visionary architect who has never lost touch with his idealism. Someone who not only wants to change the world, but who's doing it. William McDonough has received the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development, the highest environmental honor given by the United States. Time Magazine recognized McDonough as a hero for the planet, stating that, quote, his utopianism is grounded in a unified philosophy that, in demonstrable and practical ways, is changing the design of the world. With German chemist Michael Braungart, he's the author of The Hanover Principles, regarded worldwide as a kind of Bible for environmentally friendly design. And together with Braungart, McDonough is the author of Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things, a groundbreaking book that looks to nature itself as our model for design. Based in Charlottesville, Virginia, McDonough is the founding principal of William McDonough and Partners Architecture and Community Design, a firm with clients around the world, including a growing number in China. He's the sort of figure who's not only inspired a generation of designers and green builders worldwide, but whose revolutionary ideas invite comparisons with some of the landmark thinkers who've challenged us to rethink the way we see the world and the fundamental way we do things. One of those thinkers is Buckminster Fuller, a visionary designer and architect whose inquiry into human sustainability led to the concept of Spaceship Earth. Another paradigm maker is Rachel Carson, author of Silent Spring, the work that awakened the world to the environmental devastation caused by human-made contaminants. Silent Spring, wrote Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas when it was published in 1962, is the most important chronicle of this century for the human race. A third paradigm shifter, like McDonough, called Charlottesville home, Thomas Jefferson. As an architect and thinker who has been working for many years to literally change the world, McDonough looks to Jefferson for inspiration. We're sitting here in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, home of Thomas Jefferson. The founding fathers thought about revolutions. It takes time. It starts small. If you look at the Declaration of Independence uh, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, the Declaration of Independence brought the vote basically to 6% of the population. It was white, landowning males who were Protestants. So does that mean the Declaration of Independence didn't have uh, you know, an effective uh, place in our global society? No, because as time went on, People realized with emancipation, with suffrage, and so on, that the issues were fundamental and should, for, you know, needed to be broadly applied. What distinguishes McDonough's sense of mission from Jefferson's, though, is a near-apocalyptic sense of urgency. The current systems are tragic. And we realize that they're, they have tragic consequences. So if we continue with our use of energy the way we do it today, we're going to have climate change and global warming. If we continue with our use of materials today, we're gonna have oceans full of plastic, and we're gonna have toxic materials distributed widely around the globe. Uh, if we continue the way we use water, we're gonna have poison water or no water. So we need a new design. I think that, that we're in an emergency situation and that we need to affect these changes at, at a super high speed and at scale. So our focus by design is on scale and velocity. How can we make these changes happen quickly at very large scale. Um, I think we don't have a lot of time. Now, imagine a world in which every product we create, like this high-performance foam insulation, has its useful life, and then, like a tree, dies and decomposes and provides nourishment to something new. 
and imagine a world in which every product we use re-enters the water or soil after use without depositing synthetic materials or toxins. That is the world imagined by McDonough and Braungart in their book, Cradle to Cradle. It's the world, they write, that must replace our current cradle to grave reality. Resources, the authors write, are extracted, shaped into products, sold and eventually disposed of in a grave of some kind, usually a landfill or incinerator. Cradle to grave designs, they tell us, dominate modern manufacturing. More than 90% of materials extracted to make durable goods in the United States become waste almost immediately. Sometimes, the authors remind us, the product itself scarcely lasts longer. A landfill has become a vivid symbol of what we've been doing since the advent of the Industrial Revolution. In a sense, the world has become a human landfill. That paradigm must change. Cradle to Cradle is a protocol that looks at the world through a set of lenses that reflect the need for human and ecological intelligence to converge around intelligent use of energy, intelligent use of materials, intelligent use of water, and uh, social fairness. And the Cradle to Cradle piece specifically uh, talks about material flow, that things come from the earth and can return to it, or they come into industry and can stay within the industrial system. So we have two metabolisms that we see. One is the biological metabolism, so things can go back to nature. So we want to rebuild our soils and things like that. So like my shirt is not going to be um, sent back to become a shirt again, probably, but the fabric could be compostable and go back to soil. Um, something like this table, which is wood, could go back to, to soil at some point in the distant future. But something like a metal or a lamp or a camera or a television set would go back to industry. So we'd have these two metabolisms, the biological one and the technical one. And things in them would be, instead of cradle to grave, which we now do, which is take, make, and waste, you would have cradle to cradle, which is take, make, use, return, use, return, use, return, use, return. So if you, if you look at that, you start to realize that you could uh, effectively lease certain things because you don't really need the ownership of them. That's why we've effectively changed the carpet industry from something where they used to sell carpet to now effectively they want it back, which is the sense they want, they're leasing it to. So, so you could look at things like carpets or televisions or cars or things like that and say, I don't really need to own all these molecules. You know, they're not precious to me. Uh, when I finish with this television or this car, I will return it to the industry from which it came. Now, many of us believe that by recycling goods like this can here, always promotes the use and return cycle, that by reducing, reusing, and recycling, we can lessen the damage we do. But McDonough goes beyond that. McDonough challenges our assumption that the best we can hope for is lessening the damage. We created uh, the terms downcycling and upcycling because typically things that are recycled today are, are losing their value in the process. So. If a milk jug becomes a park bench, a high quality clear plastic has now become a dark polymer uh, on its way to a landfill, but it hasn't been recycled. It's been downcycled in the process. It's lost quality. On the other hand, we can imagine in the future that we could start to upcycle things, uh, thereby purifying the material and making it something totally safe and, and intelligent. So we call that upcycling. So the paradigm shift McDonough and Braungart envision means remaking the way things are made, designing products for permanent and safe reuse, designing systems that do no harm. A tall order, but already the twosome are working with Ford, Nike, and other corporate clients, along with nations like the Netherlands and cities like Chicago, to implement their design principles. 
And on 400 acres along the Catawba River in York County, South Carolina, McDonough is collaborating with this man, Van Shields, on a visionary development and museum project that will manifest the cradle-to-cradle -cradle principles in every minute detail of design and construction. It's called the Kanawa Sustainable Community, a mixed-use residential and commercial development with a museum rooted in the academic discipline of environmental history as its centerpiece. Together, the two men have conceived what promises to be a masterpiece. McDonough as architect, Shields as museum director and mastermind of a concept never before realized on American soil. Down here, where, where the museum is, you'll read the landscape becoming a building. Right. And so I think the idea that the building becomes a landscape <laughs> as you drive through the community. So you're actually you're you know, moving in and out of that experience. You're moving in and out of the experience from day one, from the very beginning. Because here you're running along the edge of the natural systems against buildings. So we ought to have a design guideline about what happens relative to these walls. These are all west-facing. Um, facades here, right? Yeah. Which is the hottest sun there is. So the design guideline might call for all of those to be green screens, for example. Right. What if all those walls were covered with vines all the way down here? So you drive in and you go, wait a minute, something's different about all these buildings. Their western facades are covered with plants because it screens the western sun. There's a great thing about the Chinese they say that when you want to have a great home you need a great path to a great place with a great view. And that could be a path between two buildings, like an alley, to a small room with a bonsai. Right. Right. But I mean, in this case, we need a great path to a great place with a great view. Well, and I think that moving in and out of those experiences, I know you like to talk about the aha moment. And it seems to me like that would really set the stage for that moment in a big, a big way because it's like it's like breathing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Kanawa is a, is a, it's a humble uh, attempt to reflect uh, design humility at a critical time in history. And design humility is a really important part of this because we, we're making this up as we go along with a lot of people trying to make a ch transformation uh, with everyone representing their interests as well as they can toward a common goal of a positive ecological footprint. Now, this is what makes Kanawa fundamentally different than other projects. Uh, and the humility is really important because it, it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. You know, we're not that smart as a species. So design humility is an important idea. Um, we're bringing together all the players who would typically build a new urbanist community and asking them to look at what's going on through the lenses of climate change, through the lenses of persistent toxification, uh, endocrine disruption, heavy metal contamination, uh, stormwater, uh, renewable energy, uh, one thing after another and taking conventional practice and trying to develop models that others could emulate that allow conventional practice to ratchet itself up toward a more idealized state in terms of uh, ecological and human in intelligence. One might imagine uh, a development like Kanawa uh, occurring in a place like San Francisco or Portland, Oregon, New York, the political history and cultural history of this area, how, how does, what does that lend to this particular project? Well, if we look at the history of, of this place, uh, we realize that in a way that's self-similar, if we look at the history of the human experience, certainly in this country, um, the, the idea that nature would, would come to be a a primary uh, partner with the human experience and be worthy of expression and, and examination seems natural and in this place it would be natural.
For Van Shields, the museum component of the Kanawha Project provides an exceptional opportunity for public education focusing on the connection between people and place. It's a specific place, yes, land along the Catawba River, steeped in thousands of years of human connectivity with nature, but its lessons have universal application. We don't understand where our food comes from. We don't understand where our, river, where our water comes from. We don't understand that every time we turn on a light bulb, we are interacting with the Catawba River because the Catawba River has a dam on it that provides that electricity for us. We don't understand that every time we drink and brush our teeth, we're connecting with the river because that's our water. We don't understand that every time we use our toilet that we're connecting with the river. So one of the main objectives we're trying to accomplish is to reconnect people with nature fundamentally so that they understand how they are sustained by these natural living systems. So that's a primary purpose. So in order to do that, the, the museum is insinuated into the landscape and actually will rise out of the landscape. And then the building, as you enter the building and pass through these different moments in the building, including the visitor experiences, then you will arrive at the river. And we have this wonderful place where there's a channel that cuts out an island on the Catawba that you will arrive at as you pass through the museum. So we see the museum as sort of a front porch for the intersection of people and the Catawba River, not just for the community of Kanawha, but really within the region and, and for everybody. And so we see the, the river as sort of the main street that runs through this part of the Carolinas and that, that the museum will be right on the front porch of it. So I like that front porch metaphor, and I'm inspired by both of these men. In Bill McDonough's case, knowing he'd grown up in Asia, I ask him where that vision originated. When I turned 40, my mother called me up and said, I'm sending you your box. And I said, what is my box? And she said, it's all the stuff of your, your first 40 years that I've kept. And it had all my report cards and my, my uh, Boy Scout badges and awards and things like that from childhood. And she said, I went through your report cards. And two things are worthy of note. One is you went to 19 schools before college in four different languages. And, um, and you haven't changed a bit. So um, I think having that experience of uh, traveling around the world as a child uh, really made a big difference to me because I always thought that it, I would always see things where in one culture people had solved a problem that in, where it would be a delightful prospect to bring that solution into another place. I was always curious about that idea of transfer of technology and uh, quizzical about culture. When we moved to the United States, when I was uh, just turned a teenager, um, I saw the incredible waste that, um, that we were performing. Uh, other students, after they finished a shower, after a workout, they would just walk out and leave the showers all running. And to see that much water running with that much energy going into it uh, was really, uh, really shocking to me. So I was the one running around turning everything off. <laughs> do you still do that? Yeah, of course. You turn off lights, turn off drip, drip. I turn off things, yeah, a lot. But, but fundamentally, growing up in Asia um, had a lot to do with my sense of how resources are used and deployed because it's a world there of limits. A lot of people, very limited resources. And so my mental model of the world is a world of limited resources and lots of people. So I think that's had a big impact on my thinking because a lot of people who grew up in the United States grew up in a world of vast resources and few people. So their mental model of the world is completely different than mine. Because my mother, Dr. Marie Urbanski, and I knew Buckminster Fuller back when, thanks to mother's scholarship on Fuller's great aunt, Margaret Fuller, I asked McDonough if Bucky was an influence on his work. Buckminster Fuller, I, I gave his 100th birthday address for his family. Um, Fuller interested me a great deal um, because of his interest in efficiency. But I, I studied Buckminster Fuller very carefully. What's also inspiring about McDonough 
is his resolute optimism at a time when many of us are hearing the footsteps of doomsday. The, the changes we need to see need to happen in a hurry. But I think when you look at revolutions, um, Jefferson essentially said this, and so did uh, Gorbachev with Perestroika, that it takes 5% of the thought leaders to all get on the same page in order to have a revolution. It's just 5%, and then things tip. So I think what we'll see here is a tipping point, probably coming at the end of this decade, um, along with projects like the museum and this community, where all of a sudden people say it is possible because it now exists. And if it exists, therefore it is possible. So our job as designers is to make it exist as quickly as possible. We can't all be designers like McDonough, but we can all make good choices and work hard for change. There's a season for sitting on porches, and there's a season for taking action. Steps in the right direction are being taken at places like Waste Corporation of America's High Point, North Carolina plant where construction site waste is sorted and salvaged. We're a, a construction and demolition debris, recycling and, uh, and landfill. The material, when it comes in, goes across our scales and it's weighed, um, and the material is then sorted. Uh, there's an excavator that actually picks the material up and drops it onto a conveyor system. Uh, the conveyor system goes up, we shake out all of the fine or heavy materials, like dirt, the rest of the material goes up across the line where it is manually picked. Uh, we pull out vinyl, uh, wood, concrete, metal, and cardboard. All the material is pulled out and dropped inside of hoppers into holding cells below, and then is taken to recycling centers where it's returned for, for reuse. So what can we learn from Bill McDonough? One thing, do not shirk, neither from the vision any of us can have, nor from our responsibility to make that vision a reality. I ask another visionary, Dennis Hayes, an authority on energy issues and the co-creator of the original Earth Day, what any of us can do to become a part of McDonough's tipping point. To the extent that people look at their impact on the planet, and they, they tend to be in a few broad categories that sort of dwarf everything else. It's, it's the residence that you live in, uh, it's the vehicles that you drive, it's your diet. And then most profoundly, in many cases, it's what you choose to do for a living. And I'll also throw in as I think, how many children you choose to have. Uh, I mean, those things, if, if we could persuade Americans spontaneously to stop moving to McMansions, to stop driving sports utility vehicles, to eat lower on the food chain, and to have one or at most two children, uh, the impact on the country would be absolutely transformational. Bill McDonough himself addressed the question of what individuals can do to accelerate change. An individual could look at composting and returning technical materials to technical cycles. You'd want to look at your energy coming from the sun. So it's renewable energy in one form or another, and there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, you want your water to be clean, and you want to make sure you're treating everybody fairly in the process. So that's really what Cradle to Cradle is about. Thank you for joining me for this special program on vision, your vision, our vision, as we make the changes we need to make. Remember, nothing's too small to make a difference. Until next time, I'm Wanda Urbanska.